Over the last couple of months, I've been working on this precision platformer game written entirely from scratch using C++ and the Raylib library. Raylib is a popular C library that lets you handle things like keyboard and mouse inputs, loading and rendering textures, playing sounds, basically anything that you'd need to, to make a game. After dealing with a load of linker errors, I was able to get something up and running fairly quickly. The first thing I needed to do was to write a collision detection system so we can actually have our player move around and interact with the world. The easiest way to do this is using an algorithm called Axis Aligned Bounding Box Collision Detection, or AABB for short. AABB is really nice because you can literally just plug two collision shapes into this function and it will tell you whether they're colliding or not. There's lots of limitations with this though and the main one being that all of your collision shapes have to be rectangles and they also can't be rotated either. This usually isn't a huge issue though. Most hitboxes and collision shapes can be represented using rectangles and even if they can't you can just make a bigger shape out of multiple rectangles. For example with this spike here even though it's a triangle, we can approximately represent this with four different rectangles. With the more rectangles you have, the more accurate the collision shape is. Usually for a lot of games, you don't need super accurate hitboxes. They can usually just be good enough. This is especially the case with single player games, as sometimes it's nicer to have the collision shapes be slightly more forgiving. So you don't unfairly die to something that it looks like you dodged. The disadvantage with this though is that this can become quite computationally expensive. As you can see here, I have a scene with three screens worth of spikes. In total, this is 2,400 spikes. And with four hitboxes for each spike, the game is checking 9,600 collision shapes every frame, which reduces my FPS by about 1,000 compared to a scene that has no spikes at all. You're probably not gonna have a level with like this many spikes, but it's still completely playable with like 800 FPS. So I'll put this on the back burner for now. I'm sure there's a, a way better solution that I can do, but uh, I'll leave that for later. I can probably also check if the player is just colliding with spikes on the same screen or within a sort of close approximation to them. That will probably save a lot of checking as it's not possible to collide with a spike that's like two screens away from you. All of the entities in the game are made through composition, similar to how a game engine like Godot would handle it. For example, the player has a sprite class or component, whatever you want to call it, uh, an animation class, and it has multiple particle systems attached to it. This makes it really easy to add new entities or obstacles to the game. To create something that can move and animate, you can just add a sprite and an animation player to it. From there, you can load the texture using the sprite class. And if you're using a sprite sheet, you can then specify the cell sizes. You can then create an animation player and give it some animations that hold some data, such as the start and end times and the speed of the animation. You can then just call this play method on the animation player with the specified animation that you want. The same is really similar for the particles. I have a particle system class that allows you to define a whole bunch of properties about the particles. I also added this feature where you can import a sprite sheet and you can have sort of an animated sprite as a particle. So for example, this jump dust effect is just a sprite sheet and that's a particle system that plays and gets fired whenever you jump. After that, you can just call the emit method when you want them to display. The particle system is quite bare bones at the moment. Apart from the animated sprites, it can only really handle colored rectangles and you can just sort of change their scale and size and velocity. To make levels for the game, what you should really do is use some software like Tiled, which is a free and open source tile map editing software. This has been used to make quite a few successful indie games in the past, but that's not really very fun. So I decided to make my own level editor. So I started working on that, which was also made using Raylib. And again, I was able to get something up and running quite quickly. All I really need this to do is place tiles, add some obstacles, and be able to save and load levels. A lot of tile map editors have this feature called auto tiling. This is where you can import a tile set and the editor will automatically calculate which tile should be placed based on the position of it. Without this, creating and editing levels is super tedious because you have to manually select which tile should go in which place, and this takes forever. I found this blog post which detailed how to implement a simple auto tiling system from scratch. All it really involves is checking the eight tiles around the one that you've just placed. From there, you can assign a bit to each of the eight positions and flip on the bits that have tiles in them. 
you can then make a map that holds the relations between each bitmask value and the index of the tile that it represents. Altogether, I think this turned out quite well. When you close the editor, it will automatically save the level data into a file. Currently, it's just saving it in a custom format inside a plain text file, which defines the number of obstacles and the relevant data for each obstacle, such as the position or rotation of it. When you load the editor back up, it will pass this data into a structure and then render the level from that. Regarding sound effects, I got this massive audio library from Boom Audio containing about a terabyte of different sound effects. I used a bunch of these rock sounds to create sound effects for the stalactites falling and breaking on the floor. When designing sounds, you can layer different ones together to create a more layered and interesting sound. For example, we can take these sounds and layer them together to create something that's a lot more rich and interesting. An issue you might hear though is that the sounds are very repetitive and become quite fatiguing to listen to when you play a lot of them. The best way to handle this is to add some slight random pitch variation whenever you play the sound. All of the audio is being handled by an audio manager, Singleton. All the sounds for the game are loaded on startup. All of the entities that need to play sounds can instantiate a local sound manager that can just call the play method on whatever sound they want, whenever they want. That's about it for now. I'll probably keep working on this and release another video fairly soon, or I'll just get bored and work on something else and disappear for another 12 months or something. So see ya.